A quick warning that this episode briefly describes a fictional abusive situation that takes place in one of the novels we're discussing this time around. The mention starts around the 35 minute mark and lasts for just over a minute. You're encouraged to skip over this if you might be triggered by it and tune back in afterwards. Thank you and on with the show. This is Changeling the Podcast. Welcome to Changeling the Podcast. Come for the glamour, stay for the vibes. I'm your host, Josh, and with us is your other host, Puka. Say hi, Puka. Bonsoir. What are we talking about tonight, Puka? We are getting a little bit away from role-playing supplements proper and talking about tie-in novelizations for the Immortal Eyes Chronicle, a trilogy from the first edition of Changeling. And these were three novels written by Jackie Casada. Oh, it's by Joshua is the cover illustration, at least the toy box. Joshua was not such a common name back then. I do kind of like the sort of, I mean, it's very like, I live in the 90s and I just discovered software for image creation covers. Yeah. I mean, I like it. I think it's uh, book design and layout and cover art all by the same person. Same people. Right on. Also, White Wolf wants you to know that they committed to reduced weight in publishing. For this reason, we do not permit our covers to be stripped in exchange for credit. Instead, we require the book be returned, allowing us to resell it. Which, having formerly worked at a bookstore that we did strip books, I'm actually really happy to see that because it felt like slaying my own kin, like ripping the covers yeah. off of books. It was really... Like, oh. right, get, roll for banality. Roll, well, right? You didn't get to roll for banality back then. You would have to just take the point. It was the worst job, just... There were days you'd just be in the back with like big boxes of books, and it's like, all right, start ripping those covers off. I was like, what? Yeah. We were allowed to take them home, but they would generally be stuffed like, you know, there was a reason it wasn't selling in the first place. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't about the stripping books thing, which. I'm yeah. <laughs> so for this episode, um, we're kind of doing a couple general talking points about these novels because obviously it's three full-length novels we're not going to give you a full blow by blow of everything in the plot everything in the setting and we've already done three episodes on the supplements proper that are associated with these books Mm -hmm. so and i guess we'll have links in the show notes for those absolutely yes but if i may open with a sort of broad question here is tie-in fiction ever actually necessary? What are your thoughts, Josh? I mean, is any of this necessary? Well, <laughs> I I don't think... I've never come across any role-playing game that has tie-in fiction where I'd be like, it even particularly helps to have read, like, strongly helps, or like, to have read the books to run or play the game. So in that sense, no, is my opinion. Interesting. Because I can think of one game where I think it is actually really helpful. And that game is Revised Era Vampire the Masquerade. (laughs) Oh, I only read one uh, tie-in novel for that. And it was based on the LARP Camarilla plot line. And it was a really good book that's a horrible idea. to. It's like anti-good to read for running a game. Well, let me amend my initial statement then. Rather than necessary, is it worth it? Hmm. Because obviously they, you know, hired writers, put in time and money, printed the books, yep. etc. Was that a good use of their resources? And for anyone who wasn't familiar with 90s White Wolf, their publishing arm was just as productive as their role playing arm or as their gaming arm. Uh, I think from a financial perspective, maybe it seems like if I understand correctly, although that's not really a question we'd answer. Did sure. that make financial sense for White Wolf at the time? But, I mean, the shelves were full of them. So, yeah. So. I actually find an argument against it can be that these are two different mediums and just like how what works in a movie and works in a book often don't work, what works in a role-playing game and works in a book don't necessarily work well, but you can get the additional thing where people can get confused between the book world and the game world. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I noticed some things like in these books where magic doesn't work the same way it did even in first edition Changeling or like I'm going through some of the stuff like mechanically that doesn't actually work in any way. 
I do have a specific point about that in my notes for later on. So we, we will come yeah. back to that. <laughs> okay. But yeah, that, that's, so yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. one thing you might, you might get the two confused in a way that at the very least could disrupt the shared understanding of the game. It's a minor point. I don't think it's a huge mm -hmm. deal. I would never say don't read it, but it's, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I thought about it while putting together my notes for this recording. And I think what I come back to is that what it's most useful for is for fleshing out the process of storytelling. Because mm -hmm. when you're trying to distill the setting of the game, even if you have a very fluffy setting book, it can be easy to lose things like the ways that character motivation manifests and in the mm -hmm. way that they act and the way that they talk, uh, the inner psychology of a character. Like, it's not stuff that everyone needs. I mean, depending on how seasoned of a storyteller you are, how deeply you want to get into that as a storyteller, you may not need mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Similarly, a player may not need or want that kind of stuff. Yeah. But if you do want it, I think fiction as a medium, like you're saying, lends itself better to fleshing that out. I mean, it's the fluffiest of the fluff, right? To have fiction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that is something that you want to incorporate more of in your game, I do think fiction is a useful addition to the rather more dry writing that you tend to get in the supplements proper. Yeah. So that's, and, and it also gives you the opportunity to be really lush with description. I think Changeling is a little bit of the exception to the rule because Changeling also has really lush description in its supplement mm -hmm. books, which we've talked about with this trilogy in particular. Yep. And I think, I think you can also different people. I'm kind of both, but I think some people, you, if you hand them a novel, they'll devour it. You mm -hmm. hand them a role-playing book <laughs> and yep. they'll be like, this feels like homework and vice versa. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But yes, but for the people for whom a novel they'd love and a, and a role-playing book, they would feel the homework, but they want to play in your game and they want to understand the setting and understand what the world's about, then handling the novel might seems like the best option there. I do think that novelizations of role-playing books work much better than the other way around. Like I've seen role-playing games developed out of novel universes and I'm just kind of left scratching my head. I'm like, mm, all right. Because I think with yeah. the novel, it's like when you play the RPG, you want to be those characters in the novel, and you very rarely can. The one game I played that did that is Amber, and that does uh, kind of let you do that. So I've never played Amber, but I've always wanted to. I played Amber, and then I read the books. <laughs> but oh, Okay. I've only read, I think I read the first two. I didn't read I, all the books, but... Yeah. Yeah. I liked them. I mean, they're... I like the good. game more. <laughs> But <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, but it's the kind of thing which I think in fiction, less stuff gets sacrificed on the altar of word count, certainly. And you, so you have that room to be expansive in a way that you mm -hmm. might not be able to be in the gaming yeah. supplement. I think a lot of the sort of stuff that you get out of fiction follows from that. Yeah. And I, I think very specifically for a changeling tabletop game, novels work better than maybe a lot of other role-playing games mm. both because the tabletop game and like the novel especially these novels where it's several protagonists right going through mm -hmm. it's kind of like a tabletop games in structure and you have things like the dreaming yeah. and stuff and you can kind of fit a story structure like a novel like story structure in your tabletop game of changeling better than most either LARP changeling like I did or other role-playing games, tabletop or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It seems closer there than a lot of other games, but... And part of that might just be the fact that changeling is so driven by the idea of stories as one of mm -hmm. its cornerstones, so... Yeah. Related to that, do you think that if books are produced for an RPG, I guess how, how closely should they cleave to the meta plot? I think... If at all. I mean, I'm... Not big on meta plot. <laughs> like, mm. I, it's not that I'm against plots, but I think having even like a bunch of novels that canonically cannot exist in the same universe, like they're all like, if, let's suppose there was a whole bunch of changeling books. And I know Vampire did this, right? Where, okay, these are like different storylines with different takes on canon characters and totally different events. Just like in your own game, right? Each game can be a separate. It's not like my table and your table have to, they don't have to both coexist in the same universe, right? 
And I, mm-hmm. so I think plots can be good, but I don't think meta plots are as important. But anyway, yeah, like examples of stories are good, but yeah. So that's because with the Immortal Eyes trilogy, like Hiking yeah. David certainly never turns up, but Anton Stark and his cronies do because that was more the first edition of the plot. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, they were they were going for a thing, and it's not really bad that they did. Yeah, I'm just saying they have to. It's almost like the meta plot became part of the plot. I would say probably mm-hmm. half and half because, in a sense, you know, the idea of there being Anton Stark and the Dantain and this kind of running thread that is something that has continued into the subsequent editions of Changeling. Mm-hmm. But the whole central story conceit of the Eye Stones, they were never mentioned again. So, yeah, it's a weird in between space. I don't know. I think what for myself, the level of connection that I want is like Easter egg level. You know, Mm -hmm. I kind of enjoy if a character pops up in a novel and I'm like, oh, I recognize that character from random supplement book X. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm reading a supplement book and then, oh, here's some paragraph that ties in with that novel. Mm -hmm. You know, so that level I think I'm comfortable with. What Mm -hmm. I think the trap is, I brought up Vampire earlier because it really seemed like I hesitate to use the term cash grab, but there, I've said it. The fact that you had a novel for every clan and then a Dark Ages novel for every clan and then a trilogy for a few clans. And there was so much that was referenced in the supplement books that occurred in the novels and vice versa. Mm. It almost felt like you really did need to kind of get all of it in order to get the full picture of the story. I have a totally different interaction with Vampire Revised. Like, I'm not the hugest vampire fan, but I read a lot of their revised supplements and I never felt like I, like I read a few of the books and I thought, I'm not even sure some of them were revised. And like the one I'm thinking of is it's just saying, I just want to say this. I actually met the author of uh, as one dead, which is like an, a, I think a, at least online was a notorious one because what she'd actually did, she was just told to write a vampire book. And then she mm-hmm. hung out with a, she knew some LARPers in the Camarilla with the really weird plot line in Toronto. And then she kind of, like took their weird stuff that does not fit canon at all and put it into a book as like the setting. And I think it's a good book. It's a terrible introduction to the setting of vampire, (laughs) but, and like she, like she didn't read the role-playing books. She talked to LARPers who are in this one shared canon thing. It's a great introduction to Toronto though, but. (laughs) Well, so, so with that one, because when was, because I'm thinking in particular of like the clan novel saga which was yeah. a very carefully crafted yeah. grand narrative kind of thing. That was certainly the meta plot became the plot. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, this was 1996. Okay. So that, would have... so that would have been second edition. then. Yeah. Second edition. Yeah. And I think they kind of, <laughs> I hate to say it. They learned their lesson from the second edition books because yep. so the ones, the vampire book that I read from second edition was the uh, masquerade of the red death trilogy, which was, mm-hmm kind of atrociously bad. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, they very explicitly declared it to be non-canon. And it was... I I was going to say, I haven't read this in over 20 years, so maybe the book I would come back to it and hate. But at the time, it was like, this is a great book that if you just pretend it has nothing to do with this role-playing game, it's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it was was that kind of feeling, except amazing is probably too strong a word for the one that I read. And I have to wonder if they took a look at Immortal Eyes and said, okay, so this is what it's like when novels are tying in a little more directly with the meta plot. Let's mm-hmm. take that idea and just go all in on it for yeah. the clan novels. And I don't know enough about the other lines to know how they did that. Yeah. But. I, I do feel though, at least with from the Changeling perspective, the, the associated books, I had read those before I read the novels mostly. Right. And mm-hmm. I did not need the novels to follow the supplements. Right. So I think I think when as soon as your media tie in requires you to jump media to understand what's going on. And I think these novels, I don't know for sure, but I think if you handed these novels to someone who likes mid 90s, what genre is this? Uh, Urban fantasy, mid 90s urban fantasy, right? Gothic punk. Yeah, Uh, I wouldn't call the immortalized trilogy gothic punk, but (laughs) if you handed it to them, right? Whether or not they liked it would have nothing to do with whether or not they've ever heard of role-playing games, I think. That's, yeah. And and I think about, so for example, you know, jumping to another another company in another game, when I was in yeah, fifth grade, sixth grade, something like that, 
I absolutely devoured the Dragonlance novels. I mm-hmm. thought they were fantastic. That's what I kept thinking of, Dragonlance novels specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Ur example. And there, there, there are so many. Yeah. And I have never once opened a Dragonlance role-playing book, you know? Yeah. So I have, I have no idea how much of what I read. And I mean, the backstory of those novels is that it was like, as the campaign setting was being play tested, they kind of took notes on the characters moving through it and said, mm-hmm. let's turn this into a novel. And that launched like 300 books or whatever it is. Um, mm-hmm. I think Forgotten Realms probably started the same way with a similar volume of work. But I think maybe what it boils down to, and this is maybe getting a little ahead of myself and, and where... I wanted to talk about this, but it leaves the question of whether the novels can stand on their own, whether the role-playing books can stand on their own, whether both of them combined as something unique and transmedia can stand on its own, and whether each of those gives its own kind of fulfilling experience to a gamer. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like that's when I want to step back and take a critical look at these novels in particular, or any novels or supplements mm-hmm. that are connected like this, that's kind of my guiding question. Yep. What would you like to see in Changeling novels? Let me ask that. <laughs> what would I like to see in Changeling novels? Okay, so I get, I want them to totally f- have the author completely read my mind as to what I want Changeling canon to be, and then strictly adhere to that. How's that sound? And or no, that I think it's reasonable. Well, not reasonable, but <laughs> I think I think what I want though really is I'd want some cool characters doing fun stuff in a rich setting. Like I don't want I don't really care about the tie-in part personally. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it could be good, it could be bad. I did find with these books, just a uh, full disclosure, I did not finish them all, but. <laughs> Um, I forgive you. Yes, but just let the, the listeners know. Uh, but as far as I did get, like, whenever it contradicted, I'm like, I, it was taking me a bit out of the book by sitting back going, and maybe it is because partly because I was reading this for the podcast, but I was going like, wait, was that possible in first edition? Because it's definitely not possible in C20 or second edition. And I'm like, no, it wasn't. And then I'm like checking things and I'm like, oh, wait, this thing, what they're saying here. This wasn't even before first in first, you know, like and I'm going through all the stuff and I'm like trying mm-hmm. to tie it in. Right. And I'm thinking yeah. I'm like deconstructing it in terms of like it's a chronicle in Changeling as opposed to a book. Yeah, and I don't yeah, yeah. think it needed that. And and there were contradictions there. There's also things about the books I just didn't like as books, but that's a separate. Well, we'll um, get to that, too. <laughs> yeah. How about you? For me, I agree with that being an issue, that if you do a novel that's specifically tied into a game system, anyone who's familiar with the game system is going to, however subconsciously, going to be checking the mechanics. Mm -hmm. So reading these, it's like when a scene with magic happens, it's like, oh, which cantrip was that? You know, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I agree with you that you have to kind of consider them as books. And the advantage with Changeling is in my mind at least changeling you can be a little more fast and loose with the mechanics especially in c20 now that you can explain everything as an unleashing it's like okay Mm -hmm. (laughs) so i do think that it's more of a concern the writer needs to bear in mind rather than well yeah i think it's something that the writer needs to bear in mind Mm -hmm. the difficult needle to thread is narrative license versus mechanical you know holds water I, I will say, like, if Paradox or White Wolf or whatever you want to call it were to just come out with another, like, had someone write another novel set in the Changeling, just it existing would make me tempted to buy it. <laughs> For sure. Well, and, and when we get to C20, we can talk about the fourth novel in this series, which is yeah. dramatically different. <laughs> mm-hmm. But what I would want to see for myself if I were reading... And I think it's also important to remember the context of the 90s when everything had a novelization. I was actually reading a really good essay kind of lionizing the idea of the novelization because it was, for films, the opportunity for bits of the script or scenes that got cut to be like worked in. And, you you know, if you had seen the film, you could read it and be like, ah, you know. So it it was a remarkable time to be a novelizer. That being said, I don't think these are really novelizations of no. the campaign books. 
these are more like ex, whatever you call it in Star Wars when they'd write about like right. <laughs> Luke Skywalker's grandchildren going on adventures or something. Right. I mean, it's glorified fan fiction in a sense, but. Hey, I, I, I enjoyed the, as someone who also enjoyed the Doctor Who fan, especially during the hiatus from the, all through the nineties and the new adventures mm. and stuff. Some of which eventually ended up in canon in the show when it resumed. Like, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. 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 Especially if there's some like level of quality control. Yeah. But what I would want to see from Changeling books, basically, I want something to your point about canon. I would like to see how much knowledge the fictional characters have of the world and the meta plot and how they frame mm -hmm. it, because that gives me something to work with when I'm trying to articulate my own character's voice. You know, so yeah. if I'm reading a mage novel, and I know this is a point of contention among mage fans, so here you go. If I'm reading a mage novel and nobody says, oh, I have the sphere of correspondence or whatever, then as a player, I'll think to myself, okay, when I'm speaking in character, I'm never going to say that. Well, it, I guess for Changeling, we could talk about the names of the arts and realms or something. Yeah, I, I mean, nobody in these novels says, oh, I have chicanery, you know, like, yeah. so there are certain concepts and ideas, but at the same time from, I mean, even moving away from a mechanical point of view, I don't think anybody talks about obeying the SG. They might, they might mention the right of hospitality or like a couple concepts like that, but it's not, yeah. nobody has a game book in the world that they can point to a page reference and a specific name uh, for what they're talking. On the other hand, we didn't have the much, much needed changeling legal drama series. Or like detective novels of like someone, somebody doing like criminal investigations for like Concordia. Would 100% be into that. Yeah. I, I would also want there to be enough connection with the game world that it feels familiar, but then enough distinctiveness mm -hmm. that it feels like it's pushing the boundaries out a little bit in the same way that a supplement does. I, so. I'd want something similar to, it's a different genre, like it, it's, different, it's a different medium. Right, so it shouldn't be exactly the same, but it would be like mm. as if White Wolf had today, if they were doing it again today, right, were to have an official Twitch stream game of somebody playing Changeling. Y you know, like I'd want. Yeah, it shouldn't be a you need to see this Twitch stream to play Changeling, like to follow the canon and understand what's happening. But you should be able to go and go, this is an example of what we think the game should be like. Not as much like the, the actual play, but like at least the setting and the, from a novel perspective, at least the setting and the, what people in the setting are like. Yeah. But are you familiar with LA by night? Is that official? Yeah. I believe elements from LA by night have been incorporated into V5. So, yeah. So it's like, you know, you don't necessarily need to watch the Twitch stream, but mm -hmm. you're going to miss a lot if you don't. Yeah, that I don't like. And I think that that's part of the sort of transmedia move that's been going on for yeah. really since the Matrix. I want it more like stages one through three MCU than stage four or five MCU <laughs> where you have to have a Disney Plus subscription to understand any of the movies right. because it's all referencing stuff that I've... And I've been watching all the TV shows, but it's still like, mm, this is a bit much, right? And if it has to get to the point you have to play a video game to understand the movie, like, no, this is getting... But yeah, yeah I wanted a bit more... In fact, I might even more want like how uh, DC has approached, not the DCU, but just the general DC stuff where it's like you have these basic ideas, but they keep doing rehashes and different things. Gross. Like these stories can't fit together necessarily, but they're all examples of the same characters kind of. Anyway, well, not the characters, but the world. It's not a perfect analogy, but. It, it is not an uncommon trend at the very least. Yeah. So wait, what would you want from that? Like, what would you want? In terms of expanding the scope or? Yeah, like how would you want if they came up with new change? Let's talk about Changeling specifically. If they had new Changeling novels, how would you want those to fit into Changeling? Or like what kinds of, what would you want from a novel? I think I sort of deliberately left it a little open-ended with what I said just now about seeing how aware the fictional characters were of the world. Like seeing yeah. how much, because fundamentally the novels have to be subordinate to the game supplements or i i assume you know <laughs> i assume yeah. that's what they're they would at least that's a piece of what i would want i would want the supplements to be primary over the novels mm -hmm. so there is that but i would want to leave it up to the individual author 
to kind of engage with it as much as they wanted. I wouldn't want them to fundamentally upend any piece of the canon. But Mm -hmm. I think that you can go, you can take a lot of creative liberties and have a lot of narrative license with how much the characters in the novel know about that canon. And that gives you a lot of room to play with. Mm -hmm. But would you want it to be like they're treating it as their setting Bible as, as the books? Yeah, I mean, but Changeling as a setting Bible has so much, like, you put something in the dreaming, do whatever you want. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah, it's just basically around King David stuff, really. And I guess this earlier thing, right? With the toy box and Don Tain, well, psychologists. This might be a good opportunity to feed into a more focused question of are these books the immortalized novels good for getting into the mood of changeling because i think that's also important do they give enough of a feel to the reader of what the changeling world Mm -hmm. is like that they can go back and play the game and feel like they can embody their character and occupy that world more fully so what do you think on that you should answer first for this one i think it it gets into a mood that is feasible Mm -hmm. for the game for me, it's maybe a little bit too, what's the diplomatic term I want to use here? <laughs> a little bit too YA bestseller for my taste. <laughs> but, yeah. But it gives me nostalgia for, I mean, cause that's what I was reading when these books were out. Like, yeah. like I said, I was devouring those books. So I think if you, if you look at the core book and the immortalized trilogy and some of those other supplements that we talked about for first edition, but not not mm-hmm. the later first edition supplements, but the earlier ones up through there. I feel like from what I read of the novels, they are consistent with that feeling. Yes. Yeah, it's very first edition, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Is that what I want from Changeling? Not exactly. But <laughs> it's... I do really like how it gets into the sort of human level stuff. Yeah. Especially, it kind of moves away. So the first book, The Toy Box, has a lot of this. And then as the quest proceeds, it gets more and more almost standard high fantasy fare. Mm-hmm. But in the first book, I don't should we should we do just like a recap of the plot very briefly or something? Like the overall arc? Sure. All right. I'm going to do this as briskly as possible. I'm just going to go for it. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> so... There's a cafe in San Francisco called The Toy Box, which has this locked chest called The Toy Box, the eponymous toy box, that this satyr named Malachar, who has this mysterious gemstone for an eye, comes and breaks open and steals another gemstone that's inside. These are two of the four immortal eyes. The immortal eyes were created when these two she brothers during the shattering refused to let each other's people pass through the last gate to Arcadia and the Selkie queen Marilla in a fit of anger cursed them to be these stone statues forever. Their eyes turned into gemstones. They got pride loose and distributed among different kits and they all have magic powers. So Malachar's eye was the keystone, which can open anything from the chest. He stole the change stone, which we, we described all this in the Court of All Kings episode, but it lets you it lets you change things, make illusions, etc. Actually, illusions is the shadow stone. But anyway, he then goes to use these to open a portal to this prison where Ertalion, the Forsworn Prince of House Elil, has been kept since the Shattering. It's kind of in between the Dreaming and the Autumn World. Simultaneously, Ertalion's been manipulating his agent Glynis of the Shadow Court to set all of this up, get him a mortal body that he can come occupy and distract the Duke of San Francisco so he doesn't stop all of this. The protagonists of the trilogy are these six oath mates who come together, attempt to foil the plot. They sort of stop the plot, sort of don't. Italian still gets incarnated, still gets hold of the stone, etc. But then the Duke sets them on this quest to stop him. They chase him to first Hawaii, where he picks up the third stone from the Menehune there and sort of sets himself up as the unseely ruler of the islands. And then he gets the fourth stone from a Dantain who's chasing the entire group. They then all go to Ireland, which is where Silver's Gate, the last gate to Arcadia, is. And he wants to attempt to force it open, etc. There's a big battle. I won't spoil too much, but that's... The overall arc of the quest. Mm -hmm. The Oathmates are Lee, who's a she-knight, Morgan, who's a she-childling and very princessy, Valmont, who's an issue loosely associated with the Shadow Court, Edmund, who's this sort of bratty redcap childling, 
Tor, who's Morgan's grandfather and a Vietnam vet troll, and Rasputin, the sort of stereotypical Puka street artist type. So I think that covers basically everything. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if you don't want to read the trilogy, that's a brief overview. Anyway, what I was going to say before all of that, the toy box starts off much more centered on ordinary life. I mean, the first scene is Morgan sitting in her psychologist's office Mm -hmm. and it's, we've talked at length about that issue, but it's a very human centered scene. And we get all this information about Lee being 18 and moving out of her family home. And she's Mm -hmm. sort of recently discovered she's a changeling and her family's like, why have you changed so much? And she still loves them, but she can't be around them. And there's a lot of that mortal drama and I like that. I mean, to me, yeah. that's something which Changeling needs more of, or or at least it needs more attention devoted to. I have some nitpicky stuff, or not, not even settings. It did a bit of the trying to sympathize with the more banal people in a way, with their take of banality being kind of, these are horrible people, actually, not just their, yeah. Well, I think it's a mix, because you do have, so even among the Dantain, there's mm-hmm. kind of a range because slight spoiler, one of the Dantain sort of gets redeemed and becomes a changeling again. So yes, folks, mm-hmm. it can happen. But there's stuff like, like Dr. Walters saying some actually kind of right. racist stuff and that you're supposed to sympathize with her as the well-meaning person. Like, mm-hmm. But <laughs> it's things like that. Anyway, bear in mind also the nineties. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. But it's, I mean, this is one of the few examples where we actually get nuanced portrayals mm-hmm. of Dantain's. You know what? You're me. very right. I, in a post-2016 world, this reads differently too, now that I think about it. Oh, definitely. <laughs> yes. Very much so. So yeah, so I like those dynamics and it was honestly a little bit disappointing to kind of see them fade out a little bit as you move into book two, Shadows on the Hill, and yeah. book three, Court of All Kings. What I want is like, okay, I want a book that's like a grump detective mystery series. With someone who has a whole bunch of ties to their life and mortal ban and dealing with banality. That's that's what I want from this. I'm I'm into it. Yeah. And that's there's so many possibilities. That's kind yeah. of the point. With Tor, you have like flashbacks to Vietnam, like all this mm-hmm. stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. So in any case, I want to take the opportunity to address a listener question, actually, because we had one question from Fetch asking if these novels give a better understanding of the game world. And I think yeah specifically what they do a good job of answering is the question how does a large community of kithane in a city engage with each other on a day-to-day basis yes and it's punctuated by some of the more momentous stuff like they do go to court there is a big oath scene there is a big fight scene you know yeah but you think that those are the bits even up to c20 i would say are holding up quite well yeah and you can get the momentous stuff from a supplement so i feel like when you have those sort of big action scenes or whatever in the novel, I don't mind them, but that's not what I read it for, you know? Yeah. So I think that's, if there's a reason to read these, I think that's the main one, because that's something you don't get from the supplements, usually. Yeah. I want to give a brief content warning before the next comment. Uh, This deals with abusive situations. One of the strongest, I think, pieces of the novel is when one of the characters sort of inadvertently through their nightmares animates a chimera and it's a belt and it's sort of the belt that they were, I don't know if it's meant to be the same belt or one that resembles, but the belt that they were beaten with as a child kind of animates and becomes a chimerical serpent nervosa. And that to me is like one of the starkest examples of yeah changeling can absolutely be a game that's nightmarish and horrific but it's also very grounded in human moments you know it's not Mm -hmm. i mean don't get me wrong the banshee is also quite well done in book three but that's the kind of thing you expect from high fantasy and that sort Mm -hmm. of animated nightmare creature is much more in keeping with the sort of street level changeling that i think really works well yeah and it was really intense like even just reading those scenes you know so yeah i kind of wish they had kept a balance throughout the novels so mm-hmm. i i do think to have the high fantasy ish and the very street level and dealing with banality and all the other types of things and dealing with social 
I mean, it's hard to do that plot wise, and it's, that's a that's a problem in a lot of fiction. Nothing to do with role playing games necessarily, where things just sort of you have this like not power creep, but like think the plot, everything just keeps getting the stakes just keep escalating, and that can be a problem. But mm-hmm. ha- so I get why it happens, but it would have been nice to have like more of a mix throughout, right? Because that's that's very changeling to me is to keep having the different aspects of the game coming in over time but. yeah yeah with the immortal eyes in particular what do you think the advantages of them existing i'll put it that way <laughs> if the, any i mean the the immortalized treasures or the books well now i want to say the treasures but i did mean the books okay we have these novels and we have the supplement books what do the novels add to the supplement books I mean, from from my point of view, I think that they make the Chronicle books make a lot more sense, you know, because yeah. when we were going through the supplements and kind of saying, well, this seems kind of out of place and weird. When you read the novels, you're like, oh, OK, now I understand why they were going for that. And I yeah. think vice versa to some extent as well. That being said, there's a lot missing from <laughs> in both directions. Like yeah. there are characters in the novels who get a lot more dimension in the supplements and then the other way around. Like I think Mm -hmm. um, the Royal court, for example, you get a lot more backstory about Duke Aeon and all of his kind of histories and tribulations in the game book than you do in the novel. Even when he's having like an inner monologue, you don't get that same level of detail. So yeah, I am curious how this whole thing was developed exactly and it's it's questions that probably nobody remembers even those that would even if we asked everyone involved but like how the novel fed and fed into these supplements and the supplements fed into the novel right yeah i imagine they were written at roughly the same time because the toy box at least was released about the same time both the novel were all these people going into the same office in atlanta or were they presumably yeah so I guess they were talking to each other regularly in a way that wouldn't, it'd almost be harder to do this today. It would be harder yeah. in a way. They were written by separate people, at least the Toy yeah. Box and Shadows on the Hill were, because the Toy Box yeah. supplement was written by Richard Dansky and the Shadows on the Hill supplement was written by... But that, um, that, that can definitely explain partly why the things were explored differently. You have different authors, right? So they're... Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that, you know, one of the authors probably said, oh, I've just written this scene if they didn't mm-hmm. say, can you find a way to work this into your text? They probably at least said, can you make sure not to contradict this? Yeah. So. And also probably a lot of, oh, that's cool. I'm going to, that gives me an idea for this. Yeah. But there's also stuff that I wish was in either side. Like um, yeah. in the Court of All Kings novel, there's a stretch of several chapters where the Oathmates are at first prisoners and then challengers and then guests of this secret order of knights that protects a lost one, Melchor, the Hidden King who is a statted character in the game supplement. I don't think we get stats for a single one of the knights. We don't get Mm. any explanation about who they are. We don't have any sort of idea of their bearing on the quest. So some of that would have been nice in the setting book. You know, (laughs) if you're going to include half of it, that's where the problem is. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's difficult. And I fully acknowledge that trying to strike that balance of what goes where yeah, you know, especially when they're being written simultaneously, or if they yeah. were being written simultaneously. Yeah, you don't need every character in the novel to have stats or anything, but right. Yeah, you're right, and that that's a, that's one good example where you need it if you're going to include the stats from the lost one. Yeah, and in the first novel, there's this whole subplot about Morgan the Childling swapping places with the heir to the dukedom, Aliera. Aliera gets stats. That's about it in the in the yeah. setting book. So. I don't know. I I guess part of what comes out of it is, again, going back to that notion of what each medium fosters, the structure of the novel and the way novels work, it lets you kind of poke a character into interesting directions. You know, you can mm-hmm. say this character has these legacies, these arts, these abilities, these role-playing hints that someone has written for the character stat block. So when I put them in this situation, how do I think that they would react? And it unfolds. Mm -hmm. That doesn't need to be in a game supplement in the same way that so-and-so's dots of soothsay don't need to be made clear in a novel. But I think that each one 
could benefit from a little more of the other, if that makes sense. It just has to be handled so delicately that I can hardly fault any author for not nailing it. Yeah. Well, and I think this whole idea, like they said this is ambitious in the first role-playing supplement, right, for the toy box. It is. They sure Like this whole thing... (laughs) This whole thing was very ambitious, and I don't think they complete like they sh- they shot for the moon, and I don't think they landed quite on the moon. You know, like they didn't quite reach that hugely ambitious target, but that's not necessarily surprising, I guess. Or it's like a single digit Apollo mission. Yeah, not Apollo one. They didn't burn on the launch pad. Apollo eight. What's Apollo thirteen? I don't think it was a disaster that they had to yeah. recover either. I yeah. mean, you know, I think they circled the moon but didn't land on it. So yeah. And part of that too was like they I think they started this they must have started this before the first edition before the core book was published they would have had to start work on oh, it. Oh yeah. This. So like you're also trying to do a role playing game and I know White Wolf was still like a young company back then and, <laughs> and trying to do things that other role playing nobody done before really there was a lot of imbi- doing very ambitious stuff and like hey let's just do it. And definitely for change like I think that's the right approach to do things. <laughs> but yeah i'm surprised you haven't brought up who i thought might be your favorite character which is georgia the wisecracking knocker cabbie but Uh, i don't know no (laughs) maybe she wasn't maybe she was i just thought knocker you know but she i mean she's one of my favorite characters i can admit my favorite character throughout all the novels was uh morgan really which is weird interesting yeah yeah that's i mean for me it's like Georgia and Rasputin, and I do want to get to mm. Rasputin in a second. But I mean, Tor is good too. Tor is also good, but with Georgia, because I think Georgia has stats at the end of the first edition core book and nowhere else. And a lot mm. of this is riding on the assumption that you have read the first edition core book. I mean, even in the toy box when they give stats for the Oathmates at the end, they're like, "Oh, you know, there's there's more story about them in the core book." And for many yeah. years, I didn't have the first edition core book. I only had the. I think book. expecting you to have read the first edition core book when reading first edition supplements is fair, though. It, it absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But I just mean, you know, the fact that this character who is rather central to the story because she's the one driving them around and occasionally rescuing them mm-hmm. and whatever, and she has this purple cab with a personality of its own and she chain smokes and she's from New York and all this other stuff. Yeah. She's great. I think she shows up at one point as like a getaway driver, but yeah, she, she deserves more. That's my point. Mm-hmm. But there's also, I mean, we talked about Hector and Sam the Clam, the gay couple club owners in the Toy Box Supplement. They're nowhere to be found in the novel. Yeah. Travesty. But I do think they were kind of going for a young adult thing. So maybe they were like, we can't have the gays in this novel for children who might read it. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so overall, scale of one to 10, what would your rating be for the novels? In a mid 90s rating system or 2022 rating system? both where if you give anything below perfect okay well in how i would rate it in in the mid 90s using the way i rated things everyone rated things mid 90s it's a solid six out of ten mm-hmm. which is actually not bad uh yeah i guess modern day would be 9.5 because anything lower than that is terrible i don't know. <laughs> yeah but, the uber system of ranking yeah yeah I, I i'd give it like a six out of ten which in canadian uh marking system is a c so a c i'll give it a c oh, wow. whatever all right yeah six i could maybe be convinced for the toy box at least to bump it to a seven i don't think i'm rushing to reread them by any means would yeah. i slightly refresh my memory in order to record a podcast episode about them sure so yeah i didn't mind them i should say that you know i didn't find them a chore to read. I didn't, it certainly moves at a consistently brisk pace. Okay. If paradoxes, trans media ambitions suddenly hugely take off. And then I find out that like Netflix or HBO is, is doing a, a series called the immortal eyes. And it's based on this. I would at least watch the first episode for sure. And not just, <laughs> there you go. Well, there yeah. were those murmurs last year about the whole world of darkness, mega, tv universe which i don't think we've heard a single thing from yeah since, I, I, the chances of, of the the immortal eyes <laughs> ending up as a series. yeah for sure I, <laughs> I don't think that's going to be at the top of their ideas pile 
No. Yeah. No, and it's very grounded in 90s aesthetics and 90s sensibilities and 90s themes and yeah. 90s culture. And I don't think it's aged particularly well. Yeah. I do think the toy box is probably still my favorite out of the three. And yeah, same. You know, I did like, so in Court of All Kings, there is also a lot of going around to the sacred sites of Ireland to drink up glamour. And you get a lot of sort of myths and stories about different places that I liked. But that's also something we got very directly from the gaming book. So, uh, you know, actually, okay, if you were to strip aside, I don't know, my the mists take away my knowledge of changing the dreaming and I'm just reading these novels. I think mm. I would continue to read them all the way through if I'd started it. And it would still be better than the vast majority of randomly selected urban fantasy books or any. <laughs> there are so many. Too. I'd put it up. Yeah. But... Well, and this is, this leads me to a question for you, actually. Yeah. Because you have frequently talked about Shauna Maguire's October Day series, which I have still yes. not read. And that's, when you frame it like that, that's kind of the response I have. Like, if I read the first of those books, I feel like yep. in the absence of any other knowledge, I would be like, yeah, right, I'll try another one. And I don't know how far I would get into the series. With Immortal Lies, at least, who only have three. I definitely but... prefer the first three October Day books over these three novels. Definitely. By, I don't know, book 14 or whatever we're in, it's starting to get into this yeah. problem that a lot of uh, not just novels, but TV shows or whatever, or even role playing games where it feels like if this was a role playing game, the characters would have too much XP for it to keep working. But <laughs> that yeah. aside, like... well, I want to add the note that without getting into the weeds of publishing, this was my expectation is a planned trilogy. And even if word count was a lot more flexible than for the gaming supplements proper, I'm sure there were still timetables and contracts and, you know, a, a vague idea of page count limitations. Yeah. And you didn't have, I mean, October day, if it's gone 14 books and still counting, that seems like a very unplanned, open-ended universe that's developing yes. with each book. So the stakes are a little bit different. That being said... I think you can go into at least the first book in each case kind of agnostically. So Yeah, and I mean, part of it is, you know, Rosemary and Rue was published in 2009. The Toy Box was published in 1995. Yep. And that's that's a lot more time for, for uh, the Toy Box to have aged poorly, <laughs> to be fair. Yes. And I am curious now, so next year will be 14 years since the first October Day book came out. Maybe I'll go read it then and see how. Yeah. See how it strikes me. <laughs> yep. And that actually starts out, no spoilers, I believe set around the same time, around the mid-90s. It starts out in the book. Go figure. Floor. Again, it's not the kind of thing that I'm rushing out to read. I think my tastes have, I hesitate to use the word matured since then, because I think people are going to get up in arms about it. But my tastes have become a little bit more, I don't know, postmodern. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Yeah. We also had a couple of listener comments, not so much questions, maybe we just two things to talk about. First, um, Sanchegger said some choice words about Rasputin the Puka. Here's the thing. I love Rasputin as a character. I do not like Rasputin as a Puka. And I think that <laughs> it's important that to I... bear that in mind. The way he comes across to me is like a probably queer, but doesn't really know how to articulate it. Performance artist type who's like hanging by a thread, both financially, psychologically, you know, yep. and yet out of that develops a lot of heroism over the course of the story or, mm -hmm. or had it in the first place and is able to express it. As a puka, I won't call it lazy because there's no such thing as lazily writing a puka, but I do think it's entry level because his puka ness is he just says the opposite of what he means. And yeah, everyone's it's, it's like the puka oh. ease. Yeah, if that was what puka if they like went hard and that's what puka ought do, all puka or whatever, it'd be better. But that's not a puka art. Yeah, right? but not by much. <laughs> Yeah. And in the third book, he does meet a fellow Puka who has her own Puka ease that's a little bit more complex. Mm. And it's like, ah, oh, okay. But that was two years into the game line, and maybe people yeah. had come up with 
you know, a little more. People said, maybe we shouldn't just be saying the opposite all the time. Yeah. At least he wasn't a bad fish milk. Yes. Because <laughs> you're saying there's no bad way to play a puka. And I would disagree, but it's hard to have that in a book. He's he's certainly not one dimensional. And I think he has a lot more dimension yeah. to him than most of the other characters in the entire trilogy. That's yeah. my take. He, he didn't disrail the entire mood of the game, so, of the book. Yeah. So that's that's better than some some people who have chosen to play Puka in the past that I've encountered. <laughs> yeah. And then the other comment, uh, Ian mentioned reading it while I think preparing for a trip to San Francisco. And that made me think a little bit about San Francisco as a setting for the first book. I didn't go to San Francisco in the nineties. I've been many times, yeah. I think starting in 2005 was, the Oh, first it time. makes me want a time machine for sure. Yeah. It's, I think it does justice to some of the tensions that were present in the city at the time in particular, mm -hmm. because it was kind of before the explosion of gentrification, but it was in the air. And yet mm -hmm. you still had a lot of stuff with crime and homelessness is certainly present. So I think it does the city justice in terms of its atmosphere. There's no like, oh, now we're going to the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, now we're going to mm -hmm. climb Coit Tower. So it doesn't feel touristy by any means. Yeah. So that I What's like. funny is it actually reads kind of like slightly later 90s Toronto, probably because yeah. Toronto had hit that level of gentrification at that point. It's it's I kind of vaguely cityish, but it's a certain kind of city. Yeah. It's definitely not St. Louis and it's yeah. definitely not Miami, but there's probably a time period it could have been New York or London, but it'd be different times. It could be a part of New York or a yes. part of London. Well, I'm not sure it covers all of San Francisco. I don't know San Francisco. I've never been there. So They do go to Oakland at one point, so mm -hmm. there is that. That being said, so I think they, they kind of hit the right notes with it in the first book. I haven't been to Hawaii, so I can't say for the second book. For Ireland in the third book, I just didn't feel like I was getting any sense of Ireland as a place. But by that point, they had moved into yeah. like full-on epic adventure mode. Yeah, if so. it was, it would have to be like very remote, disconnected part of Ireland or something. Which... Yeah maybe there's probably i think there was more of that in the 90s but yeah there was but they also it was very touristy because there was literally yeah. a, a subplot where they're going from tourist site to tourist site. yes so. so i guess it would be like going to rural ireland and being a tourist but not anyway yeah never mind yeah it's a mixed bag i think though that yeah. this kind of gets into the particular issue with world of darkness novelizations in that they do have to kind of align with real world places in history. You don't have to worry about yeah. that for Dragonlance. You can make up whatever you want. So, although I not, I don't notice that's a problem. I think there's, there's a reason I like. Oh yeah. No, no, not a problem. Fantasy and world of darkness. Yeah. But it's a constraint, a consideration. Yeah. I think that's about all I have to say on this trilogy. Anything else that you would like to mention? I think if you're a changeling completist, you will not have as much trouble with these novels as you do with some of the supplements, for sure. Yeah. They're cheap. They're on drive through Just get them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like... I got the PDF. I wish I could find... A, maybe I didn't. I just looked on drive through I wish I could have like a, an EPUB instead of the PDFs. Maybe they uh, just didn't, yeah, just didn't yeah. see it. It's a bit annoying to read. The, the form factor doesn't quite match whatever but, uh... it's worth bearing in mind they are the only changeling novels with the exception of the one that was in an omnibus collection from 1997 and i'm not even sure that one really counts yeah i didn't know about that one yeah it's in the essential world of darkness there's We're also the muse that. in the quintessential world of darkness but that's a short story i believe oh, okay we're not we're not reviewing that. Book, oh, we, we do also have the vampire crossover <laughs> novel. We'll get to all of this at some point, I'm sure. Okay, I didn't know about some of this stuff. This is interesting. We'll have to. Yeah. We should at least discuss it whether or not we're reading it. At the very least, there's less changeling fiction than certainly certainly less than vampire. Vampire probably has more than the other lines yeah. combined. I don't know. Mummy might have less than changeling. <laughs> but... Wraith. How much wraith fiction is? Wraith. There? Yeah, that's true. Wraith probably has as much or less anyway as you said completionists go forth so once again this is changeling the podcast uh you can find us changelingthepodcast.com uh you can 
find our Mastodon account at changelingpod at dice.camp. We're Changeling the Podcast on Facebook. You can find our Discord link on our website, changelingthepodcast.com. You can email us, podcast at changelingthepodcast.com. And our Patreon, patreon.com slash changelingthepodcast. You could also just send balloons into the air, messages attached. We'll probably we'll probably see those. Are you near the coast? Will you be able to take care of the bottles? I'm too far from the ocean to get those. Yes. I'll, I'll take the bottles. You take the, I don't know. Uh, the moose. You can just you stick them on the, mo- the moose. It's very dangerous means of transportation information. But uh... Oh, I now want that to be how changelings communicate with each other between remote parts of the kingdom of Northern Ice. Just moose chimera with messages tied to their antlers. So when I was playing Changeling LARP that got me into the, the, cha- the several year long Changeling LARP chronicle that I was in that got me into Changeling. At that time in Toronto, which is where I lived and was playing the game, the city of Toronto decided to have all these weird moose sculptures all throughout the city with like strange designs on them and stuff. And then we had to do a quest of like hunting them, the chimera that were formed from them because they were causing problems for the kingdom or not for the kingdom, for the, for the county. Brilliant. (laughs) So the count sent us all out to go deal with them. So many ideas now. Anyway. Yeah. Yep. So once again, I'm Josh. I continue to remain Booga. And uh, yeah, if you're brought up to a weird daunting psychologist, don't violate the sheet by telling them the secrets of your local group of changelings. Or you can just enchant the living daylights out of them. You know, little of this, little of that. <laughs> Later. In true Pukaese fashion, we can neither confirm nor deny that we may, in 2023, be offering a six-part seminar series entitled How Not to Talk Unlike a Member of a Kith to Which Some Folks May Have Occasionally Denied is Called Puka, a fusion of logic and skullduggery that we expect will make even the most well-adjusted orator weep with frantic dismay. Regardless of whether or not this comes to pass, we hope that you'll give us some support to keep bringing you changeling-themed content. The best ways to do this are by leaving us a review on the platform of your greatest listening convenience and or signing up for our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash changelingthepodcast, with which you will join the esteemed ranks of patrons to whom we give a shout out. Like so, Derek, Dorjadas, Horio, Raz Kabuz, Sandjager, Sija, and Terry Robinson. Thanks for dedicating your earballs to our podcast, and until next time, keep on dreaming.